Tonight, David Johnston says no to a public inquiry into foreign interference. It would have been an easy choice. It would not be the correct one. We ask him about the recommendation and the personal attacks on his credibility. The conservative leader won't even meet with you, Mr. Johnston. That's how little faith he has in, in your ability. Plus, a special ad issue looks at where this goes next. Airport security is changing for some, but will it really streamline summer travel? Will it solve all the problems? No. And why are more pregnant women turning to cannabis and ending up in hospital? It does raise this concern of, are people using cannabis to self-medicate? This is The National with Asha Tomlinson. Good evening, Adrian is on assignment. Reaction is split among Canada's political leaders tonight to a long-awaited report on foreign interference in this country's elections. Today, Special Rapporteur and former Governor General David Johnston said he would not recommend calling a public inquiry to investigate them. He does, however, want to see public hearings happen to address serious problems with intelligence communication. It's all adding layers to this critical, very political debate. Tonight, we'll sit down with David Johnston himself and hear from some MPs personally affected by all of this. But first, Rafi Bujikanian takes us through Johnston's findings and the reaction. After months of pressure for the government to call a public inquiry into foreign interference, Justin Trudeau deferred to David Johnston, and David Johnston says no. It would have been an easy choice. It would not be the correct one. He says that's because much of the intel he studied to draw up his report is top secret. Johnston was asked to look into foreign interference after multiple news stories alleged meddling by Beijing in the last two Canadian federal elections favoring some liberal candidates. Several leaked materials that raised legitimate questions turn out to have been misconstrued in some media reporting. Johnston found no evidence cabinet ignored intelligence reports on foreign meddling, but he did identify a case when intelligence was not properly passed on to ministers after Conservative MP Michael Chong's family in Hong Kong was allegedly targeted by a Chinese diplomat two years ago. Johnston says it's part of a bigger problem. I have identified serious shortcomings in the way intelligence is communicated and processed from security agencies through to government. He is a family friend, cottage neighbor, and ski buddy of the Prime Minister. The Conservatives dismissed the report, attacking Johnston's credibility. They also shot down his suggestion to get top-secret clearance to look at a classified part of his work and come to their own conclusions. We're not going to allow the government to silence leaders of the opposition by swearing them to secrecy on this matter of grave public importance. I don't think... Canadians would want or expect any of their leaders to choose ignorance when they can choose to have the facts laid out for them. Johnson intends to hold some public hearings to address the issues he's outlined and write a second report by October. The opposition, though, says it won't be satisfied with anything but a full inquiry. Rafi Bujikani on CBC News, Ottawa. Now, that report mentions some current and former MPs by name who have been personally affected by the issue of foreign interference, facing allegations, or potentially targeted. Ashley Burke brings us that side of the story tonight. Former Conservative MP Kenny Chu says this new report doesn't cut it. He wants a public inquiry. Nothing short of that, it's good enough. Three pages of David Johnston's report are dedicated to Chu's case. He looked into allegations reported by the Globe and Mail that China's government was operating in Canada with two aims, ensure a liberal minority and defeat certain conservative candidates, including Chu. Johnson's report concluded that China's intention appears to be focused on assisting pro-China candidates and marginalizing anti-China candidates, not party preferences. Johnson also said articles spread on Chinese social media questioning the conservatives' China strategy couldn't be traced to the Chinese government. A sophisticated, um, mature and complex regime, it will be very unlikely that you will find the smoking gun with their fingerprints on. 
She was not the only MP who may have been targeted and who calls the report disappointing. We need to have that inquiry. We need to have a commissioner that is chosen by all the political parties so that is completely above the political fray. The prime minister recently ordered CSIS to brief all MPs who may have been targeted by China's government. One of them was NDP MP Jenny Kwan. She's still waiting to meet CSIS. She joined NDP leader Jagmeet Singh during his interview with Johnston. As a Chinese Canadian, I want to ensure that the cloud that's hanging over our head uh, is um, addressed. Independent MP Han Dong released a statement saying, I feel vindicated by Mr. Johnston's report. Johnston said the allegation that Dong urged China to keep the two Michaels in jail is, quote, false. Dong stepped away from the Liberal caucus to fight those allegations. The prime minister says he's open to hearing from Dong about if he wants to rejoin the party. Ashley Burke, CBC News, Ottawa. Chief political correspondent Rosemary Barton is here. Uh, Rosie, what is the main takeaway? Asha, remember the reason we're here. It's because those intelligence leaks led to weeks of questions about how the government was dealing with foreign interference and then a suggestion by the opposition parties that the Liberals were somehow benefiting from just allowing it to happen. Johnston, though, says he found no credible evidence of a cover-up or negligence. The problem is he can't tell us much more than that. So this is a really who do you trust, who do you believe question again. And Johnston is saying, listen, MPs can on the Security Committee, they can check my work. And so can opposition leaders if they go through a security clearance. And that's an attempt to try and make this a little less political than it has been. This issue, let's face it, doesn't appear to be going anywhere no. anytime soon. The Conservatives have worked really hard to try and question Johnston's credibility and his reputation so that no matter what the outcome was today, they would have some reason to criticize him. When I sat down with David Johnston this afternoon, I asked him about that very thing. Are you really, though, the person now to look at how the systems can be improved? The Conservative leader won't even meet with you, Mr. Johnston. That's how little faith he has in, in your ability. That's most unfortunate. Um, and uh, there's nothing I can do about that. Um, Am I the right person? I'm sure there are many other people in the country who, who do this job. I've been asked to do it, and I guess I've been asked to do it because I have a track record of doing these kind of things, and I'm a professor of law and uh, have apparently served effectively in two or three dozen other uh, inquiries that have led to a positive result. So that's for the public to judge. We spoke a lot more about the report, and we'll have that interview in just a few minutes. Thanks, Rosie. There is some closure tonight for the family of a Montreal teenager who was murdered nearly 50 years ago. Police say they've finally found who killed her. Allison Northcott tells us how investigators cracked this cold case. Sharon Pryor's family has been grieving for nearly 50 years, waiting for answers that have finally come. The solving of Sharon's case will never bring Sharon back. But knowing that her killer is no longer on this earth and cannot kill anymore brings us to somewhat of a closure. Pryor was 16 years old in 1975 when she left her home in Montreal's Point St. Charles neighborhood to meet friends for pizza a few blocks away, but she never arrived. Four days later, her body was found several kilometers away. She'd been badly beaten and sexually assaulted. The resolution of this uh, cold case is uh, based on... Uh, new investigative techniques, uh, but also uh, advances in forensic biology. Over the decades, police investigated more than 100 persons of interest before DNA technology and commercial genetic genealogy sites helped lead them to the killer. Franklin Romine, originally from West Virginia, lived in Montreal when Pryor was killed. He died in 1982. He started uh, his criminal career at 11 years old. We're talking here about 13 convictions, uh, six or seven prison breaks. With DNA from the crime scene and Romine's brothers, police exhumed Romine's remains despite his family's objections. The DNA they extracted was a match. Scott Magus lived in Sharon's neighborhood and said a lot of people have been waiting for this news. About time. 48 long years. She was a beautiful young lady with a heart of gold. For her family, those 48 years without Sharon have been hard. You have never left our hearts and you never will. We love you, Sharon, now. May you truly rest in peace. The police force involved in Sharon Pryor's case says it believes it's close to solving other cold cases using the same technology. 
Allison Northcott, CBC News, Montreal. In another cold case, police in Portugal are now searching a reservoir in connection with the disappearance of a British toddler. The reservoir is about 50 kilometers from the resort where Madeleine McCann vanished back in 2007. She was three years old. Officials declined to say if a new tip prompted the search. Last year, a German national was named as a suspect. The federal government says it is making changes to ease the burden at Canada's biggest airports in hopes of making summer travel a little smoother. Sam Sanson takes us through the new rules at security and whether experts think it'll make a difference. Airport agony was all the drama last year. Lost luggage, delayed and cancelled flights. Ottawa doesn't want a season two. All of us uh, don't like to see erosion of confidence in travel. Ottawa says part of the solution, a new verified traveler program, an attempt to streamline airport security check-ins. Starting in June, six airports will have new dedicated security lines for these program members getting on domestic and international flights. The whole idea is to speed things along when you're in security. So for example, if you're one of these verified travelers, you won't have to take off your jacket, you won't have to take one of these out of your bags. That way, the line moves quickly and more people get through security faster. Military members, police, airline and airport staff are eligible. Regular Canadians can join through Nexus, a system that already speeds up customs to and from the United States. Right now, 1.7 million people have a Nexus card, though there is a backlog and a $50 U.S. fee for people applying to the program. The processes and procedures that uh, Canadians have had to endure are outdated, outmoded, launching a program that allows trusted travelers, travelers who they already know, travelers whose data they already have, uh, to benefit from expedited screening is a long time coming. This year, with almost all COVID-19 rules gone, airports are expecting another massive wave of passengers. I think it will contribute to enhanced efficiency at the airport. Will it solve all the problems, the sh staffing problems? No, though they have to be addressed separately, independently. A number of airports say their staff is back to pre-pandemic levels and swear last summer won't be repeated. Sam Sampson, CBC News, Toronto. According to multiple U.S. media outlets, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis is going to announce his U.S. presidential bid tomorrow on Twitter. DeSantis has long been seen as Donald Trump's biggest rival for the Republican nomination. His big announcement tomorrow is expected during a conversation with Twitter CEO Elon Musk on Twitter's live audio chat platform. As for Trump, he's expected to be in the middle of a criminal trial when Republicans choose their nominee next year. Trump is facing 34 charges, including falsifying business records and covering up hush money payments. He has pleaded not guilty. The trial is expected to begin next March. Back here at home, advanced voting is now underway in Alberta's provincial election. As Julia Wong shows us, in a race that has no clear favorite, some Albertans have already made up their minds at the ballot box. Drake and Sarah Worth say the votes they're casting could define Alberta's economic future. Oil is being less kind of used around the world and it's not as much of a profit center in the years to come, so we need to look beyond that. <laughs> yeah. The Worths are among the more than tens of thousands of Albertans voting early on the first day. We have one party that's not fiscally responsible from my perspective and another party where the leader talks out of both sides of her mouth all day long. Hi, how are you guys doing? Good. As advanced voting began, UCP leader Danielle Smith was cheerful at the ballot box. Do I get a receipt or anything? No. <laughs> Likewise, NDP leader Rachel Notley also keen to project confidence. This is an important election for Alberta. But no one has a clear edge in the polls and no single issue dominates the race. Uh, climate change is a big thing. Um, employment's a big thing. Just a nice stable government and someone that's listening to the people. To trust the person that we're um, electing, that they're, what they're saying now is correct. This political analyst says it's not clear what more the parties can do to convince undecided voters. UCP is claiming we can't afford another four years of NDP government. On the other hand, the NDP leader is saying we can't have four years of this a person who is um, not trustworthy. It's kind of a 
an even battle. As for the Worths, they have high hopes for whoever wins. I want to see someone who's fighting for Alberta as part of Canada as a whole, um, but also just showing that um, it's more than just about big business and it's about people. Both parties are now focused on going door to door and getting supporters to cast their vote. And they don't have a lot of time. There's less than one week to go until Election Day. Julia Wong, CBC News, Edmonton. Still in Alberta, cooler, rainy weather appears to be helping firefighters. Many of the major wildfires burning received some rain, which means these are good days for firefighters to make real progress. That progress is still coming with new warnings that more evacuations are possible and people need to be ready. Right now, about 70 wildfires are still burning throughout the province, and there are several air quality warnings caused by heavy smoke. Police in Spain have arrested seven people after separate alleged racist incidents directed at a black pro soccer player. As Susana da Silva tells us, the arrest came after that player called out the league and some of its fans. Well, this has turned very ugly indeed. His anger finally boiled over. Real Madrid star Vinicius Jr. could take no more of the crowd's racist slurs. The game briefly paused amid an atmosphere even his veteran coach said hit a new low. I have never experienced anything like that, said Carlo Ancelotti. I never thought I would have to consider taking a player off because he's being abused. After the match, the 22-year-old Brazilian star tweeted, Racism is normal in La Liga. The competition considers it normal. The federation and our rivals encourage it. As global outrage grew, the league's president responded, accusing Vinicius of slandering the league. Que ignore, por favor. A position quickly dismissed by the head of Spanish football, who said, please ignore the irresponsible behavior of La Liga's president before admitting the sport and the country has a problem with racism. And it's not a new problem. With a number of high-profile incidents, including this one, where a banana was thrown at Barcelona star Dani Alves. And last month in Italy, more than 150 Juventus fans were banned after racist chants targeting an Inter Milan rival. If people cared, they would do something about it. And I'm tired of having to talk about the same thing that happens over and over and over again. Soccer observers say it may take clubs actually walking off the pitch to finally make change. It's been threatened for a very long time. Players have said this, listen, we won't put up with this. But when it happens, nothing really does happen. The other way, they say, is through police. In this case, three were arrested after the weekend's incident, another four arrested for hanging an effigy of Vinicius off a bridge in January. Brazil's fans and government are demanding lasting change. For now, Valencia has been fined and will play in front of a reduced number of fans for five games. Susana da Silva, CBC News, Vancouver. New Canadian research is raising concern tonight about using cannabis during pregnancy. By far, the, the largest risk factor was having severe morning sickness during pregnancy. Why some say more research is needed into potential risks. Next. As David Johnson rules out a public inquiry into foreign interference, the opposition is questioning his credibility. Tell me how what you released today, though, enhances public trust. Rosie sits down with the former governor general, and at issue will have its say, too. Battling back the flames. It was very, very hot. The fire was coming right towards us. A father and son's heroic fight to save their family cabin. We're back in two. Riots broke out in Cardiff, Wales after the deaths of two teenagers. Police initially denied rumors of a police pursuit, but CCTV footage appears to show the boys on a bike being followed by a police vehicle moments before a crash. An independent investigation is now underway. More than 100 people have taken to the streets, setting cars on fire, demanding accountability. Police in Quebec are investigating allegations a daycare worker gave melatonin to children without the consent of their parents. The child care centre notified parents in a letter sent out Saturday. 
It's alleged kids were served drinks containing diluted melatonin. According to the daycare, the worker is no longer employed there. There are concerns tonight over a rise in the number of pregnant people showing up in Ontario hospitals after using cannabis. Warren Pelly looks at why they may be using it. Since cannabis was legalized, new research suggests more pregnant individuals are ending up in hospital after using it. The study in the Canadian Medical Association Journal shows the number of instances jumped from 11 to 20 cases out of every 100,000 pregnancies in Ontario. By far, the, the largest risk factor was having uh, severe morning sickness during pregnancy. Study author Dr. Daniel Myron says pregnant people being treated for serious nausea and vomiting were nearly 10 times more likely to be hospitalized for cannabis use as well. It does raise this concern of are people using cannabis to self-medicate or treat uh, symptoms in pregnancy like morning sickness? You are willing to try almost anything. I want... This mother of two experienced hyperemesis gravidarum, a pregnancy condition marked by extreme vomiting, dehydration and weight loss. She didn't try cannabis to treat her symptoms but knows other women who did, with mixed results. In some cases work, but is not a magical recipe neither. For at other moms, it also generates the opposite effect. The new study found an association between people who were hospitalized for cannabis use and higher rates of adverse outcomes for the infant, such as earlier births, lower birth weights, or admission to a neonatal ICU. But we don't know whether um, you know, the, the adverse outcomes of being small for gestational age or having smaller brains um, is caused by cannabis or is caused by nutritional deficiencies due to hyperemesis. So this American scientist who suffered from hyperemesis gravidarum herself says more research is needed to weigh the benefits of cannabis versus the risks. These people who are taking cannabis in pregnancy to treat their nausea and vomiting, they deserve answers um, as to the safety so Lauren, if someone is pregnant and thinking about using cannabis, how should they navigate all of this? Well, let's just add this to the long list of things people have to worry about when they're pregnant. Obviously, we need a lot more research to understand these impacts, and it's tough to study things when people are pregnant. That's why a lot of medical research doesn't really have pregnant people involved in vaccine research or new drug treatments. But in the meantime, what we've heard from these experts is it's better to err on the side of caution, and if you are curious about using it, at least talk to your doctor first. Sound advice. Thanks, Lauren. Thank you. And after the break, Rosie is here with more on our top story tonight. Hi, Asha. Not long after he announced his decision not to call a public inquiry into foreign interference in Canadian politics, I sat down with David Johnston, asking him about his report and the attacks on his credibility. And what troubles me is this discourages other people from taking on these assignments. That interview coming up. And after that, the Ad Issue panel standing by to weigh in. Chatel, Althea and Andrew will join me to talk about that and more. David Johnston's report calls for public hearings, but not a full public inquiry into foreign interference. And when he sat down with me earlier today, he was firm both on that message and on his credibility to deliver it. The politics around the issue, in his words, unfortunate. Mr. Johnston, thank you for making the time. I appreciate it. A pleasure, Rosemary, as always. I want to start with the issue of a public inquiry. You said it would be an easy choice, but not the right one, uh, and that it would not serve a useful purpose to enhance trust. Tell me how what you released today, though, enhances public trust. Well, this is the first part of our mandate, Rosie, which goes uh, back in April through to the end of October. In the first part, we were asked to deal with the allegations of foreign interference and the, the question of who knew what, when, and what did they do about it? And that's an attempt to assess responsibility and possibly uh, negligence or failure to respond to one's duties. To come to a conclusion on that, one had to go into in the intelligence that we've developed over a number of years, and more particularly in the last year or two. A good portion of that is classified, and it's classified for a reason, mm -hmm. because it's obtained from our sources in our networks around the world and people's lives are at stake with respect to gathering and presenting that information. When we went into that information um, and all the intelligence, we came to the conclusion 
that there was no cover-up by the government, that there was no negligence. What there was was a, really an insufficiency of the machinery, machinery of government, let me not say a failure, but in dealing with this very complicated subject of foreign intelligence. We cannot say in this report, which is based on public sources, what we learned through the confidential information, nor could any other public inquiry, right. both to, to hear it in public and then to report on it in public. Right. So it's impossible, I think, to have a public inquiry that goes into that. What we do say is, in coming to the conclusion that we found no negligence or no attempt to manipulate the information for political advantage, but what we found is some significant challenges in our system of gathering. Part of what you're saying, though, is that I went, my team and I went and checked the information, and yeah. here's what we found, Yes. and now you have to believe me. Do, do you understand that for some Canadians that might be difficult? Yes, and I would say don't believe us. There are two committees of Parliament, the National Security Intelligence Committee of Parliamentarians, whose job is to oversee foreign intelligence, etc. Our report, including the confidential section, will go to them. They will review it, doing their own review. Part, part of the issue around having to believe what you are saying today is around your credibility. Yes. Uh, I, I'm not sure if you expected this to happen. Uh, obviously, the allegations, particularly from the Conservative leader, that you are a friend of Justin Trudeau's family, yeah. you are a member of the Trudeau Foundation. Uh, should you have anticipated that, Mr. Johnston, that, that you would be attacked in that way and that this might undermine the credibility of what you've offered today? No, I did not anticipate that my credibility or my impartiality or integrity would be attacked. The facts are, with respect to a friend of the Prime Minister, when uh, his family returned to Montreal, uh, we knew his father, mm -hmm. and we had, we had a condo at the sl slopes of Mont Tremblant, about 100 meters from the ski trail. Mr. Trudeau Sr. and his three boys had a country home about 50 kilometers away at Mont Val Moran. Um, on five different occasions over three or two or three years, his three boys and our five daughters skied together in the mountain because he could park his car at our condo and we'd ski out to the mountain. On one of those five occasions, he had to go back to Montreal and I dropped the boys off at their mother's home and their, their husband about 10 kilometers away. So we were not neighbors. That was the contact with the current prime minister. Do you regret taking this position given the way you've been attacked and your credibility has been attacked? Because I think those are things that are important to you. Yeah, the other important thing is I asked the retired justice of the Supreme Court of Canada, Frank Akabuchi, to review entirely the Trudeau connection. There was no conflict of interest in his view. Uh, I'm not in a position, Rosie, to speak about whether I'm uh, injured or touched by those, those attacks happen. I am surprised and concerned in this respect that during my professional life I've been asked to chair, serve, be on advisory committees, including being governor general for five years and then a two-year extension, all of which involve a trust in a person's integrity uh, and so on. Those appointments, two or three dozen, have been by uh, prime ministers, premiers, ministers of both major parties at provincial and federal yes. level. There's never been any question about my impartiality or my integrity. I was very surprised that that happened. And what troubles me is this discourages other people from taking on these assignments. And moreover, it creates distrust in our public mechanisms, and that's not appropriate. You alluded to it off the top there, but, but the suggestion around these media reports has been that in some way the government, the liberals, turned a blind eye to foreign interference or allowed foreign interference to happen in order to uh, benefit politically from it. You're saying you sound, found no evidence of that and there was nothing that, that you needed to see that would have proven that to be the case? The answer to both questions is no, we saw, found no credible evidence to suggest that kind of manipulation and we were satisfied that the documentation that was provided to us was very extensive and that the interviews we had were pretty candid with people. So no, we could not find that kind of fault. Where we did have concerns and we've registered them is we have a system that is not functioning as well as it yeah. should. In part because foreign influence has grown exponentially, especially the Chinese influence which has come upon us like a, mm -hmm. a tsunami in the past two or three years. But, but I mean in particular around some of the reporting yeah. that, that was inaccurate, false, or, or wasn't complete because it was based on a piece of intelligence rather than the whole context. What was concerning to you around those instances that you looked at and were able to say, yes, this is troubling, no, it's not, there, you know, part of this is being looked into? Well, I think when we found that we had the whole picture, 
and found that those leaks, in fact, were erroneous in the conclusions they draw it and the suggestion that there is a nefarious attempt to cover up. We did not see that. Mm -hmm. We saw a system that was not performing as well as it should, but we didn't see any effort to, to try to say this is something we sweep under the rug. I think there's clear knowledge that we have challenges in dealing with foreign intelligence and we have to do a better job. Are you really, though, the person now to look at how the systems can be improved? The Conservative leader won't even meet with you, Mr. Johnson. That's how little faith he has in, in your ability. That's most unfortunate. Um, and uh, there's nothing I can do about that. Um, am I the right person? I'm sure there are many other people in the country who, who do this job. I've been asked to do it. And I guess I've been asked to do it because I have a track record of doing these kind of things. And I'm a professor of law and uh, have apparently served effectively in two or three dozen other uh, inquiries that have led to a positive result. So that's for the public to judge. I don't, didn't sign up for this job. Uh, no one wants to do this kind of thing. I've been asked to do it. I've spent my life responding to this kind of things, and I'll do so, I guess, as long as I draw breath. Mr. Johnson, thank you for your time. Appreciate it. Great to be with you, Rosemary. Thank you. Thank you. Lots to weigh in on from that interview. Our At Issue panel is joining us for a special Tuesday edition. Chantal, Andrew, and Althea all standing by to talk about the ramifications of Johnston's decision. That's coming up next. Hi there, I'm Rosemary Barton. Here's a special edition of At Issue. After weeks of examining top secret documents and talking to dozens of people, David Johnston says a public inquiry into foreign interference is not the answer. I have found no examples of ministers, the prime minister or their offices, knowingly or negligently failing to act on intelligence, advice or recommendations on the issues I have investigated related to the 2019 and 2021 elections. The Prime Minister says he will go along with Johnston's decision. I committed uh, to listening very carefully and abiding by the recommendations that the, uh, that, uh, the former Governor General made. But Pierre Poiliev insists Johnston is not impartial and this is not the answer. Conservatives are not buying it. We need a full public inquiry. So what's to be made of Johnston's decision? What are the political consequences? Let's bring in our panelists, Chantelle Bear, Andrew Coyne, Althea Raj. Good to see you all on a Tuesday. Chantelle, uh, are you surprised at this decision? And what did you make of the justification for it? Uh, yes, a bit surprised because uh, pressure, pressure for a public inquiry seemed to be so strong that uh, I believed it had become irresistible. I accept the, the limits of a public inquiry, but to go from let's not have a public inquiry because everything you really want to know, you can only find out if you have a top secret security clearance to let's do, let's have me do some public uh, hearings uh, is a bit of a leap. Mm -hmm. I think uh, in the political context, Mr. Johnston probably would have helped himself by recommending that someone else chart the way forward uh, after this. Andrew? Well, essentially, he's saying to us, uh, take me up my on, on, on faith. Take it. Yeah. Uh, trust me. I'll, I've seen stuff that you haven't seen. But if you'd seen it, you'd agree with me that all of these multiple reports from intelligence sources are all basically amount to nothing, uh, that the prime minister and his cabinet didn't know anything, uh, where he essentially takes them at their word on it. Um, that's fine, it, you know, that may be the case, but I don't think see people why people should really necessarily have to take that on faith, particularly when the alternative of a public inquiry was available. He waves it away by saying, well, it couldn't possibly be uh, public in any regard. Well, again, we're just taking his word on it. There's been lots of public inquiries that have had to deal with information, that w whether, whether information should be released to the public or not. Mm -hmm. There are processes for evaluating that. Uh, I, I think this is um, likely to not likely to mollify any of the government's critics uh, and not likely to engender a lot of public trust in the process. Althea? It's like if Mr. Johnston uh, seeks to operate in the sphere that is free of partisanship and he doesn't realize that he's actually operating in a system that is fueled by partisanship, the easy answer would have been a public inquiry. It is what the opposition wants. It actually would have been better for the government. They get to turn a new page with a new commissioner 
put this controversy behind them, start afresh. And if what David Johnston is, says in his report, that there is actually no wrongdoing, that the government did not fail to act based on political partisan reasons, then why wouldn't they themselves call a public inquiry? I think that is also part of the equation today. I think, you know, seeing where Mr. Johnston is coming from and kind of, you know, thinking back to his past writings, I'm not entirely surprised he went this way. But I am surprised the government decided to accept it. Well, it, it's funny because he actually says a public inquiry would have been the easy answer, but not the right one, and would not, in fact, have uh, led to more public trust. The, quite the opposite of what you're all saying, Chantal. Okay, I, I was never, and I still am not, a public inquiry convert, but going through the motions still matters. Mm -hmm. And what this does is not going through the motions. I um, will disagree with Andrew on the notion that he's only saying, take me on trust. He's basically saying, anybody who has access to the same information as I have yeah. had will come to the same conclusion. Opposition leaders, opposition MPs, come and read it. But I'm not sure that uh, it will satisfy the, the, the need of the public to say, well, you know, the, the perspective matters, and your mm -hmm. perspective maybe is not the one that uh, we trust most. Andrew? The best part of the report is the invitation to uh, NSICOP, the Committee of Parliamentarians, or the opposition leaders, if they're willing to be sworn to secrecy, uh, to test and look at his recommendations. The question is, what do they do if they find fault with it? How do they make their case to the public that he's got it wrong if they can't reveal any of the information? So we're kind of in a circular loop here. The prime minister, as I've said many times, could re could disclose all the answers to these questions, could come out in public in a press conference and answer all the questions, or he could answer the questions in a public inquiry. But in each case, he'd have somebody actually probing his right. answers and comparing them against other things on the record, et cetera, to see whether they stood up. Whereas in this case, he's basically sort of, you know, Father Confessor David Johnson has taken his his word for it and basically transcribed it and repeated it back to us, and we're all, again, supposed to take it on faith. Althea? Uh, two things. One, I actually do think that an inquirer probably would have access to more information than Mr. Johnson has had. It just, when you start looking, other things tend to pop up, sure. and yeah. he doesn't have subpoena powers. Um, you know, so I, I'm not sure that I agree with that part of his conclusion. But to Andrew's point, the Committee of Parliamentarians that meets behind closed doors, they do issue public reports. So much like this report, where Mr. Johnson goes through the intelligence with regards to the media leak and says, well, I, I can sum this up and tell you what uh, I have found a little bit, like in the Arara inquiry, what, what came out mm -hmm, publicly. Mm -hmm, yeah. um, you know, the, that, that committee can do that, and it has done that. The problem in the past, frankly, is that it has done really good reports, and the government has ignored them, mm -hmm. well, basically ignored them until last March. So uh, where does this go politically, Chantal, if you all seem to think we're sort of, we haven't moved any further without a public inquiry? Unless uh, the opposition parties, the NDP uh, in particular, are willing to move this to a non-confidence motion, yeah. I'm, I think that's probably where we are. Uh, I'm not convinced that Canadians would welcome an election on this. There are people who would, but I don't think that uh, uh, that would be a, a cause to ca cause a, a snap election. So I am guessing that some of the parties, maybe not the Conservatives, will take up the offer. I mean, if you're offered to look at the evidence and you say, I don't even want to see it, you yeah. also have a problem. There is a challenge here That's right. for the opposition parties. Yeah, poten yeah, potentially a trap even in some ways, Andrew. Yeah, I mean, I, I think they're still on the high ground of asking for a public inquiry. I don't know why, other than the assurances of David Johnston that it couldn't possibly be public, I don't know, so, see why we should dispose of that option. But I think the other wild card in this is what further revelations come out. Althea. Well, okay, on the political stuff, yep. what happens is the conservatives make a lot more money fundraising off of this. But on the other hand, I think, you know, Mr. Poilievre today had a press conference and he talked about how he does not want uh, to be sworn in and he does not want to see the evidence on which David Johnston has based himself. 
because that is a trap and that would silence him. Well, if he's the prime minister, he has to see this information and he still will not be able to talk about it. So this argument makes no sense to me. And I feel like on the one hand, they are, they are, there is a message there that resonates with the greater public. And on the other hand, there's an uber partisan message, mm -hmm. message that really makes no sense. But that being said, if I was a conservative, I would be popping the champagne because this is a day to celebrate. It could not have been better than that. This could not have been better than they anticipated. Okay. Uh, thank you for coming on Tuesday. We will talk more uh, on Thursday, so you'll have to come back, I'm afraid. Thank you. And with that, I'll send things back to Asha in Toronto tonight. Thanks, Rosie. When we come back, two men against an inferno. Because once the intensity heat gets too close to you, you could be dead in seconds. A father-son duo race to save their family cabin in our moment. A dire warning tonight about wildlife around the world. A new study says half the planet's animal species are in decline. And Lindsay Duncombe looks at what that means. The only place you'll see a Panamanian golden frog is behind glass at research facilities like the Vancouver Aquarium. It's extinct in the wild, something a new study suggests could happen to a lot more species, and soon. What we found is that 48% of animals on Earth are actually uh, declining. You heard that right. Close to half of animal species on Earth are declining, according to a study published in the journal Biological Reviews. It analyzed population trends related to more than 70,000 species. We can have good reasons to believe that the species that are today doing well, as we take a snapshot, will not be doing that well in the future because the populations are decreasing through time. The authors are among scientists warning that the Earth may be entering another extinction phase. The last one was when the dinosaurs died. They give two main reasons for that, habitat loss to create cities, farms and roads, and climate change, which can make animals sick. The closer to the equator, the worse it gets. The study's authors say compared to what's happening in the tropics, the situation here in Canada is stable. But that does not mean our animals aren't under threat. These guys lost their habitat to farm development in BC's Fraser Valley. The Vancouver Aquarium is breeding and reintroducing them. It's not easy. There's only so much land to go around and frogs aren't going to win against humans. Plans agreed to at the COP15 UN Climate Summit in Montreal were designed to stop biodiversity loss. The challenge will be implementing them. And we do not have time here to wait uh, for action to occur in years from now. Action is needed now. It's needed today. Or else more creatures could be stuck behind glass or lost forever. Lindsay Duncombe, CBC News, Vancouver. Clarence McCallum snapped this picture of his father, Louis, standing tall against the flames as a wildfire closed in on their family cabin in northern Saskatchewan last week. With the flames roaring toward them, the pair made a dangerous decision to burn a ring around their cabin and make a protective barrier. Their fight against the fire is our moment. Me and my dad were uh, just waiting for the fire to come. It was coming quick, and I told my dad, I said, the only way we're going to save this cabin is if uh, we back burn around the cabin. So I grabbed a five-gallon uh, tank of gas. I poured it right around the cabin and uh, lit it up, and it sucked it right into the main fire. I've been in the fire business for 40 years. My son's been in there 15. You have probably minutes to get out of there if things blow up. To me, the most dangerous thing was the intensity of the heat. Because once the intensity heat gets too close, you could be done in seconds. It was very, very hot. The fire was coming right towards us. Me and my dad took a run down to the lake. We ran right into the water, hopped in our boats. And right away, I thought, oh, the cabin's gone. The next morning, took a cruise up and took a good picture of the cabin and see if it was still standing and it was there. We done it. We, we saved it. What made me really happy was my son and I were doing this. I love my dad and and the way we did this job, it, uh, it made me feel good inside. Wow. Okay. Uh, between the two of them, they have six decades of firefighting experience, and this was a risky save even for them. Louis is actually retired, but Clarence is currently working to fight other fires in northern Saskatchewan, so we are very thankful he took the time out 
to share this story with us and to talk to us tonight. That is The National for May 23rd. I'm Asha Tomlinson. Have a good night.